terminal velocity drag problems like this one are a sure sign that your professors hate you. Yes, we want you to become capable and safe engineers who create new technologies, make everyone's life better, and have a happy family and a very fulfilling life. Later, but while you're an engineering student, it's like we go out of our way to make you miserable sometimes. And this type of drag problem that requires you to solve for velocity requires an iterative solution. And iterative solutions suck. It means you just have to guess and check and then guess again and then you just keep going till you get bored of it. I know you're not gonna like this problem, but it's still a good one, so let's do it anyway. Terminal velocity is the maximum velocity for a falling object where the forces are balanced and it stops accelerating. Essentially, if you look at your free body diagram, you have your weight vector pointing down, your drag force pointing up. Sum of forces equals mass times acceleration. At terminal velocity, acceleration equals zero. So that means your drag force will equal the weight. And that gets us here. Drag force equation is the drag coefficient, the cross-sectional area that's essentially seeing the wind, density and velocity squared. Weight can be calculated a bunch of different ways, but since we were given specific weight, you can get to weight by specific weight times volume. So this V with a horizontal line through it, that's volume in a way to make sure that you never get it mixed up with V for velocity. And I already previewed that this problem is gonna get annoying later, but at first it starts off not too bad. The purpose of fluid mechanics assumptions is to choose something that's close enough to being true, but makes the problem way easier. So for this hailstone, let's assume that it's a sphere. I know the hail can come in all sorts of weird shapes, but it'll make the problem way easier if we assume it's a sphere than to try to account for all the weird geometry. That means the volume of a sphere, four thirds pi r cubed. So for a half centimeter size hailstone, right? This is like pea sized hail, 6.5 times 10 to the minus eight, meters cubed. All right, this spherical assumption also helps us find area. The area is not the entire surface area of the sphere, it's just the cross-sectional area that the wind sees. So it's just sort of the, the fattest area, it essentially represents the area of a circle that is the equator of the hailstone, since that would be the widest part. Area equals pi over four, diameter squared, or just pi r squared, and you get point zero 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 one nine six meters squared. So we're probably done with the easy parts for this problem. The next thing I'm gonna find is gonna be density. And this is actually where I think a lot of students are probably going to start struggling on this. Your first instinct for density is gonna be to go to tables in the back of your textbook since you're given temperature. The problem with that is that those tables are density at standard atmospheric pressure. For this problem, we were given that we're actually slightly below atmospheric pressure. Right, 96 kilopascals is actually below standard atmospheric pressure, at least at sea level. Right, at sea level, it's normally about 101 kilopascals. And this kind of makes sense because a hailstone is falling from a higher altitude, and so this may actually be the pressure at some given elevation. But we don't have to go to an elevation table either. You can solve for density using ideal gas law. So if we assume that the atmosphere is functioning as an ideal gas, which again is a reasonable close enough approximation, we can use the version of the ideal gas law that's PV equals MRT, and then mass divided by volume is density. So you can actually get density from within the ideal gas law equation. Again, and that's something that a lot of students would probably miss for this problem. And even if you do get that far, probably the hardest part of the ideal gas equation is R. There's tons of different values for R, and it's not always obvious which one you really need. So make sure you grab one that's in metric units. I'm gonna grab the 8314 that's in joules instead of kilojoules. But this value R introduces moles into the equation. And that's gonna be what needs to clue in in your mind that you're gonna need to include the molar mass of air. R, the gas constant in the ideal gas law equation, often needs to be divided by the molar mass to get rid of that moles. So I look up the value of air, 28.96 kilograms per kilomole. And that's good because my density value needs kilograms in it. So some calculator work, I get about 1.2 kilograms per meters cubed, which seems on the right order of magnitude, right? Air is, is very light, about one kilogram per meter cubed. That sounds right. 
But to double check that I haven't actually made some error, I'm actually gonna go through and actually cross out all these units to double check that yes, I do actually, all these joules and pascals does reduce down to kilograms per meters cubed. It takes a little bit of extra work to get rid of newtons and joules to do this, but this is the easiest part of the whole problem to make a mistake has to do with this value R, the gas constant on all the units. There's a bunch of weird just units associated with it. So it's worth the extra time to actually plug in the units to, to really be sure. So at this point, I've even lost track of what I was trying to do in this problem. So drag force is equal to the weight. Plug in all the numbers I have so far. So what I've got left is drag force, velocity squares equals about 32. And this is where you're kind of stuck because in order to find the drag force on a sphere, the easiest way is to just look it up in a table based on the Reynolds number. But to know the Reynolds number, you need to already know the velocity. So there's no way to find one of these without already knowing the other one. And this is where the iterative solution comes into play. You just guess a value for one of them solve for the other one and see how close your guess was. And if it wasn't close enough, then you guess again and you just keep going until you either get bored of it or until your answer doesn't change, which shows that your guess was correct. So without any good reason to choose any particular number, I'll choose a drag coefficient of one. It gives me a velocity value of about 5.7 meters per second. Now to calculate the Reynolds number, this is something that students find very unsatisfying. We don't have a good way to find the viscosity for this problem at zero degrees Celsius and 96 kilopascals. The, the table you're probably looking up in the back of your textbook only has standard atmospheric pressure at various temperatures. So here's an extra assumption you have to make. So we're gonna use the actual real density that we solve for using the 96 kilopascals, but then I'm gonna pull viscosity assuming standard atmospheric temperature and pressure. So these two numbers are not actually consistent with each other, but it's really as close as you can do. You use the best density you can get and the best viscosity value you can get. And so by the way, I'm using this mu viscosity instead of nu viscosity, the one that looks like a V, because this way by using mu, I can actually use density. And since I know this density value is correct, I think using this viscosity value will be closer to being accurate then using the kinematic viscosity nu. Since kinematic viscosity would not be incorporating this extra information we have about density. So plugging in the numbers, get a Reynolds number around 2000. You can find a drag coefficient for spheres table in the FE reference manual, which is one I have up on the screen here. Your textbook probably has one also that looks kind of similar to it. The axes for both of these are logarithmic. So each of these lines between 1000 and 10,000 are two, four, six, and eight. So it goes 1,000, 2,000, 4,000, 6,000, 8,000, 10,000. So our number is right around 2,000. So basically goes straight upwards. And on this figure, the sphere is the solid line. So I trace that over to the left and it looks like it's just below that horizontal line. So we'll call this about 0.39 for the drag coefficient. My original guess was a drag coefficient of one and we got a drag coefficient of 0.39. That is not close enough. That means we have to do it all over again. So I'll start this time with a guess of 0.39. This leads to an even faster velocity around nine meters per second. Again, we're still making an assumption about viscosity for Reynolds number, but it's the best we can do. This time the Reynolds number is much higher, about 3,200. Jump back up to the figure, 3,200 will be between 2,000 and 4,000. A Reynolds number of 3,000 won't be directly in between the two and four. It'll be closer to the 4,000. Remember, as numbers get bigger, they get closer together. 3,200 will definitely be much closer to the 4,000 than the 2,000. Trace that upwards to the solid dark line. And good news, it's actually basically horizontally right next to my dot from before. So this section of the curve is basically horizontal. And I can trace that back over to the left and we'll call this again a drag coefficient of 0.39. Final answer we're looking for was velocity. What's the terminal velocity of the hailstone? It's this last value of V that we use, 9.2 meters per second. One meter per second is a little bit more than two miles per hour. So this nine meters per second would be around 20 miles per hour. And that's why you don't die if you were caught outside during a hailstorm. The terminal velocity of these little hail pellets is only around 20 miles per hour. So it's gonna sting if you get hit by hail, but it's not gonna necessarily seriously injure you, at least for this small pea-sized hail. So if you wanna keep studying drag, but you don't wanna do more of these iterative problems, 
Check out this video, which has two really short FE exam style drag questions. They help really reinforce the basics, but they're super quick. Just kind of plug and chug, look a number up, just knock it out and, and you're gonna feel really proud and satisfied and be a nice kind of ego boost.